Hi, this is Suwani for Lounge with Afric Lounge. We're here with the legendary Femi Kuti himself. He's here in Boulder, Colorado to perform today at the Boulder Theater. You can see this video on tradiov.com, also on My True Spot Radio, and This Is Africa as well. Thank you, sir, for uh, granting us this interview. We really appreciate it. Sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Let's get right into it. Um, how did it all start for you outside of the legendary fella? You know, when did you realize? Was there an anecdote? Was there one particular moment when you noticed that oh, I can do this? You know, this is something that I, I, you know, I can actually take to the next level. Not about the next level much. I just wanted to play music from when I can remember. I always wanted to play music, so it was it was never about taking it to the next level. I just loved my father's music as a kid. Probably six, seven. Then I just wanted to play. Eventually, I wanted to play in his band, and then after playing in his band, it was. Wow, I need to find my own identity after a while. You've performed across the globe. You see people who can't speak your language, people who, you know, can don't even understand where you come from. But they can sing your music. And what does that tell you about? Can I just tell them to stop playing so they don't disturb you? So performing across performing across the globe, you see people who can't probably even speak English, can't speak your language, but they can sing almost every song, tune for tune, word for word. What does that tell you about how music crosses different society, different parts of the world? Music has always been said to be the universal language. Um, I've never had my doubt about music. And then when we go into science, they say the world was created with a big bang. The bang must have been a musical note, because the bang must have had a sound. If it had a sound, it must be a musical note, probably C A or D. So we talked about the struggle of not just Nigeria, but Africa as a whole. Do you sometimes see some of the songs that you sit down and write and say, hey, maybe you want to do something different, like a bang, 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 for instance. Like you just write it, you're not necessarily looking for it to be a hit, but in case of bang, 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 it turned out to be a hit. I never thought bang, bang, bang was going to be a hit. I just heard the melody, and it was very catchy in my head, and I could not erase it from my head. And I thought then... I wanted to sing something different because I'd already done so many political songs at this time. So now, yes, sometimes I do want to sing something different, but events don't allow me to. I hope I'll be able to move away from this zone one day. I think um, probably this album, this next album that will be out in April, will be a turning the turning point to do something different away from so much politics but then it depends it, really my problem i have is i see so much suffering that i can't imagine a love song that would be more important than what i see in probably congo sudan nigeria south africa greece these days portugal i've got many friends in europe these days they tell me they're broke they don't know what their the future holds I can't imagine singing about a broken heart I have that would be more important than that problem. So that's the, the dilemma I face in my mind. It's such a big, oh, she left me. Please, baby, don't go. I love you so much. Man, I must be mad. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great point. That's a great point. Now, let's transition to the album. An album's coming out in April. Um, what should people expect in terms of, you know, the writing? Now that you've, you've, you've talked about the issues that's going on in Sudan, the economic strife in Greece, Spain, and Portugal, would people see some, 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 some of that in the music and some of the definitely, things you write? Yes, definitely. Not just that. They will find, I hope they will find courage in the music. I hope it will bring inspiration to them. Because as much as the music is a downer or the lyrics, the music is very uplifting. So I hope they'll be able to find strength. The whole purpose of that album is for the listeners to find strength to continue in their respective day-to-day -day events in their lives. So as much as there's a lot of criticism in the album, it's not 
negative, negative. It's a negative, positive kind of album. The title, No Place for My Dream, is very disheartening if you look at it deeply. No Place for My Dream, you might feel discouraged. But the music in it is so powerful that you hardly, it is probably if you really want to go into the album and start saying, oh, is this what he was saying? Oh, I didn't realize that. But you will find that time has gone so fast that probably a year before you realize what I was talking about, blah, 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 blah. Because it's really to uplift the listener at the end of the day. You had a song on uh, your Shoki Shoki album, and one of the songs, the track was, Chela um, Masha Forehead, people gather, they come, they go come, then rush and to die. To don't die. When you write songs, do you sit back and picture what people really go through in their daily lives, and then you embody that into your writing? It depends. To don't die was written because of a girlfriend I have had. She told so many lies, and then we said to crack jokes. I said, you tell so many lies. She says, yes. I said, oh, why? I said, because the truth is dead, and she just said giggling. And I said, okay, I'm going to write a song for you. Truth don't die. So I said, she said, how am I going to write a song? I said, I'm going to just make a story out of it. I said, the truth died. Okay, you know what? He died yesterday. <laughs> He, okay, truth, let's make truth a being. So truth now sets out, he's going to the international airport, he wants to go around the world to start preaching, we must all stop lying. On his way, a trailer hits him at the junction of the bus stop. And everybody tried to save him, ah, truth has been hit. So it was a funny story between this girl and myself. Just jokingly, say, ah, why did you tell this lie? I caught you like, but it wasn't a fight, it was, a very nice conversation that I said, okay, you, I'm going to write a song about you. I said, how am I going to write a song? And I told her I was going to write it. And that was how truth came about. Oh, interesting. And, and, and that story, I've never heard about that particular song. And it was Nobody knew this story. This is the first time I'm telling the story. Because you now ask, if you don't ask the questions, then I will not tell you how things come about. <laughs> We're breaking grounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're in America, you're tour in the U.S. Uh, a popular genre in America that's taken similarities from Afrobeats is hip-hop. Yes. Hip-hop's origin is the people's struggles and all of that. Two hip-hop icons, uh, Jay-Z and Will Smith, have championed the fellow Broadway. In your opinion, how big is that, that that lives on in a form of a musical that's going around America, even as you tour America as well, too? Wow. I could answer your question in two ways. First of all, I'm not surprised. There is no sensible person that will hear a last story that will not be overwhelmed. From the beatings he went through, his courage, his bravery, and if you want to look at it ridiculously, marrying 27 wives, you will laugh. How did this man marry 27 wives? How did he get 27 women to marry him? What kind of person is this? I mean, he just did many things that the conventional person would like be overwhelmed or totally put off guard that he want to read a book, he want to watch a movie. You could, there's so much commercial venture in a story like that. And if you take a story like Martin Luther King or Lumumba, you have seen, these are very serious characters that films have been made. Now, my father's story has so much of that and then so much fun because being creative, he's a musician, and then in his life, as much as he was fighting all these battles, there were so many happy moments in his life as well. So there's no way from, I mean, as a kid, we listened to, there's no, probably no great artists that came out of America that we did not listen to, from the blues to jazz, and funk, pop, rock. So, but no story caught me like my father's story. And I know I wasn't biased because he was my father, because I used to just look at him that, ah, what kind of person is this? I mean, I'll go to school, come back, see all my friends' fathers. 
See, I mean, Bob Marley was a big hit, but his story did not touch me like my father's story. I mean, he would do, the, probably because I was right there, I saw it. Even, take for instance, the burning of the house. There is no, there is no story of any fighter, if you know the story of what went on that day, that did what he did. He stood on the balcony and he was raining abuses at the soldiers. You will have, if you were there, you you will have, and you were concerned, you will have been frightful for his life. That, uh -uh. You are abusing soldiers. If they catch you, they are going to kill you. I mean, he was saying, so my God, you, I, MFs, <laughs> bastards, idiots, motherfuckers, I would, uh, I mean, this man has no gun. He's in his house. And you have 1,000 soldiers surrounding his compound. And he say, yeah, deal with you. Deal with you. <laughs> but you know what went on? I mean, what, what kind of person is this? Well, he had a voice. Yeah, he had a voice. That's what I'm saying. There is no, that story, there is a, a kindergarten in France that is teaching that story in Nazi school. They have a story play, and I saw it somewhere in south of France. So, you see, teachers in France, they have turned it to French, and they are teaching their kindergarten this story. There is no story. I mean, when you hear it, you can make it funny, you can make it commercial, you can, it's such a big story that you hardly find anybody in history that has all these things going on for him. Is it the women? Is it the smoking? Is it the confrontation? Is it the music? So many things were going for him. And really, I think it caught him off guard as well, because this was the, at his time, stardom was very relative new. Everybody wanted to be popular, but the magnitude of his popularity crossed across all boundaries, all ethnic groups. Nobody was this popular. He could not step out of his door without everybody saying, fella, 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 fella. It was too much for a being. How he even managed it? It was, I mean, when you go into details, the nitty-gritty of his life, you have to be overwhelmed. So I'm not surprised a Jay-Z or um, Will Smith will look at it and say, wow, what a man. I'm not surprised America will catch on to the story. Now you have to understand, the story was already in America long in the 70s because people like Miles Davis were listening to him. Not secretly, but they did not see any reason why to ask questions like, why is this man not on the radio? But every, Miles Davis, he, was, he said it, he was inspired by my father. Now, my father, it was Miles Davis that changed the history of my father, listening to him, coming out of England, playing the trumpet, and he heard Miles Davis. This, this was a turning point in his life. Who would believe that in a few years' time, that would be Miles Davis' turning point too. That a fella will inspire Miles Davis. Now, fella did inspire many great American artists. Stevie Wonder, John Lennon, and Paul McCartney in England. So, everybody was listening to fella in their homes, but he was just not getting the commercial airplay like most of the musicians. Then, in, the, in every home in Africa, everybody was dancing to zombie. So, I don't even believe he even knew the extent of his popularity because he was too focused on the confrontation and the fight he had with corruption. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> Say, in those days, in that era, we had the crazy social media that we have today. The internet boom, the Twitter, the Facebook. Would he have been able to appreciate what he was doing a lot more? Because he, was, he might have been removed being far away in Lagos, not really knowing what was going on in L.A. or in Motown in, in the Midwest. You could never know what was really going on in his mind. And he just came up with different ideas. I'll give you another ex example. When he threw shit in our Biola's house, it was my sister who gave the advice. He was just sitting down. That this Abiola man is giving him so much trouble. He doesn't want Decker to pay him the money Decker owes him because Abiola had bought over Decker. What can he do to tell this man he's wrong? And my sister just said, throw shit in his house. He said, ah, that's a good idea. <laughs> just jokingly. 
and everybody thought it was a joke. And he did it. And on one day, midnight, he just woke up. Choo -choo 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 -choo. I went to the prison there. <laughs> Nobody knew for a long time. Everybody suspected, but there was no proof it was him. He said he was going to take the coffin to his mother, a mock coffin to the head of state's house. Nobody, you can't go, you can't do that. Where are federal guards are. And on the last day, one of the young members, the young African pioneers who are working with all this, because he had this young group of boys who, were, who came out of university managing the young African pioneers. He had this um, newspaper that he distributed free, which was very popular. Everybody wanted to read this. So, and it was free. He would distribute about 50,000 or 100,000 copies every day, every week or so. So these boys that manage it, now remind one of them, ID, said, Oh, fella, tomorrow is the last day. Oba Sonjo is leaving. You haven't taken the coffin. Oh, yes. We'll do it as soon as I wake up. We thought he would sleep and forget. Seven o'clock, he just woke up. Yeah, yeah, let's go. I was even praying for him to fall. I personally prayed, please let this man forget. Let him. <laughs> you see, so he will just come up or somebody will come up with a, a brainstorm and he will just seize it and he will do it. So you never know what he will do. With this internet craze going, you will never know. He probably will use it to his advantage. He probably will just say he doesn't have the time. You will never know what he will do. Probably somebody will manage it for him. Probably he will be... What you expect him sometimes to be concerned about, to be very nonchalant about. And by the time he even shows interest in it, everybody will have forgotten about it. And then you wonder, why didn't he see the interest then? Probably, you never knew what he would come up with. Probably he was too involved with his compositions. Because the demand, you must remember, he was first and foremost a musician. The demand to create new songs was always... Um, must have been very pressurizing for him. Whether as a composer, I know. Everybody says, ah, when are you going to give the next song? Are you not going to give the next song? What are you going to sing about? And at this time, he had done so many tunes to think of a new melody. Why would the internet fascinate him? Why would he want to tweet? Speaking of Twitter, you're heavy in Twitter. Yes, I just joined recently after how many years? Why? Because when I was teaching myself the trumpet, and in 12 years I was learning, I never Facebooked or Twitter, and everyone said, join, join, and I could not find how I was going to find time. Why teaching myself, trying to maintain the integrity of my music, and now start going Twitter, yeah, 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 and I know if I get involved there, the way I saw everybody, where will I have the time? So now, I found, just towards the end of last year, I found, I saw light at the end of the tunnel in my trumpet playing. I said, oh, ah, in the next five years, I could be fantastic on this instrument. Okay, maybe I need to settle down a bit and glide. So I now signed to Facebook. When I signed to Facebook, and then nobody knew. Then one person, oh, now I get like, Minimum of 20, 30 friends a day. And the questions they ask, I have to be polite. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> and somebody might ask the same question. No, I might get the same question 20 times. It's not like giving a, an interview where you have answered the question. So you ask the question. They you ask the same question two minutes later. Did you not read the page? But you have to be polite to him. You have to be polite to everybody. Now, then somebody will ask, why are you answering everybody? Why are you accepting everybody to be your friend? Then I ask them the same question. You want me to refuse people that love me friendship? So I'm caught in this very nasty terroristic web of the internet. And I, it, it, it affects me because I want to do the Remy Fasola, somebody click again. Oh God, I have to reply. Somebody asks, you never and I never shut off my computer. So they ask, don't you ever sleep? It's just I never show. I can't be bothered to shut up and log on again. So I always leave it on 24 hours. So I'm following you on Twitter. Yes. <clears throat> and just like you said, you know, you're practicing and then you, you get a beep and then you're responding. Mm -hmm. There's a particular question that was asked. Someone said someone drove from Oret to Lagos. Yes. On an empty tank. Yes. And I was the one who responded and said, you can't have them drive from Lagos to Adokota. Just have them drive from VI to Ikeja. 
when you see those type of things, sometimes do you want to hold back from responding? Or just the, your natural instinct as a person? Yes, sometimes I want to hold back because I know my answer will be very controversial. And especially when it's a religious person involved in it. Now religion is playing such a terrible role, I think, in Nigeria right now. That poor people just, the priest takes advantage of the poor people. And it's so rampant. And it's not a conversation that you can have intelligently with many people. Because they are already very biased and they believe whatever the pastor will say to them. So when I see that kind of tweet, I'm, I'll say, if I answer, everybody's going to be against me. But because of the respect they have for me today, you have to be a bit polite when they are going to respond. Now they are forgetting, then I've got another thing on my side. The world is in Twitter. It's not just Nigeria. So I will ask, am I ready to go on with this case? But that one, that tweet you are talking about was just so annoying. I had to say, ah, ah what rubbish. <laughs> Somebody drove. Then, remember his answer was, it's and not you a, him a liar. And you don't call him a liar. It was a journalist that misquoted him. Why didn't he say the journalist misquoted him? Or to Lagos. Are we stupid? Ah, uh -uh. on an empty tank. So I had to ask, so I went for that. I said, okay, next time, what you should do is call all the press. If he knows God gave him that ability to do that, he should call all the press. See, my tank will empty his car tank. I'm going to drive from Lagos to Kaduna. Then we will believe. We will, I will look, me too, I will come and join this church. You know, but when somebody that's so powerful, like Adeboye, starts to make statements like that in the press, he should even be arrested. You see, a good government will stop him. Please, why are you misleading the people? Is that somebody in authority must call him? You drove on an empty tank from here to here. Okay, can you repeat the feat again? Because if he does have that kind of power, then Nigeria needs that power for progress, right? Then maybe you can help us get electricity. Maybe you can find a way that all our youth will have a good education. What let's let's this of all of us will say, God, God, Jesus is coming, save us. Maybe we can put this power into better use that God Himself will be impressed. Let me ask you this. You've turned fifty. Yes. And at fifty it seems like you said, life, you know, life becomes better. No, it's 40. Life begins, life becomes, at, 40. Life begins at 40. When you get to 50, you well, have lived. You should have lived. But you've lived, you've lived a great life. You, you've had a great, you had, you had a great father. I cannot you, complain. You've told, you've told the world. What have you seen about Nigeria that gives you at least some hope? The young people. There's a very, not just in Nigeria, the world generally, there's a very vibrant, restless, young generation that if world leaders are not very careful the world will erupt and there will be total unruliness there will be anarchy and chaos everywhere that world leaders will not be able to handle and that will be nobody's fault but the united nations europe america and african governments so this generation they're very impatient they have no jobs they want to excel they're ready to, they don't want to be bad. They need people to show them the right thing to do. But there's no, there's no space. There's no future. They see no future. So this, and in Nigeria especially, you see they're very vibrant. They're very vibrant. They, even if it's, if it's, you take the art form, many of them, even when they are playing hip hop or whatever, they want to do something positive with their life. They don't want to be failures. The system has not given them the chance to be honest citizens. Or is the system, even in my time, when we were growing up, education was you're going to get married, you're going to have children. You get a job. Then you start growing up. Then you don't you just see that you are you don't see that dream materialize. You first don't know where you're going to get the money, who's going to employ you? Are you going to start your job? Which bank is going to give you a loan? So, but Nigeria was not, there were not that many as a young man growing up in Nigeria in my time. Now, when you, 
when you take the afternoon in, in Nigeria, for instance, when the schools close, you just see thousands of young people coming out of school. It's very frightening. All these boys of 15, in five years' time, where are they going to be? Where is the workforce for them? Then you see, you know, in the university level, they are coming out of university, unemployment. And they say in Nigeria, we're 160 million. Now, if we want to go by the rule of life, where is you get to age, you must die, somebody must take over. That doesn't follow now. We live, we, somehow we are living longer. We don't retire like we are supposed to retire. And there are no jobs. And there is no, there is absolutely nothing a young person will say is going to have His future is, is uh, he has a good future. Boy or girl. So, it's, it's really, it's not that I have, um, confidence it's frightening when you re when you look at it again it's really frightening that if nigeria erupts where is the 160 million people going to run to who is going to come to the aid of nigeria and it is erupting when you see what's happening with Boko Haram. now the media in nigeria is not even giving us the true situation of Boko Haram. that place for me when i think about it it's like a war zone when you hear what amnesty is saying about it it's very frightening now it was starting at the top of my Duguri. It, is, it has moved right down to all of my Duguri. It has moved into Kaduna, Kano, and Jos, um, Abuja, moving down to Kongi. Will it get to Ibadan? All it takes is one of them to reach Lagos and just blow themselves up in one of the most popular places of Lagos. The place will just erupt. So when you see, and then the government has no solution. They say they are going to, they need dialogue. You want to dialogue with terrorists. These people don't want to even dialogue with you. They say you must bring the Sharia, Sharia law to Nigeria. What is, how did this start? I already raised the fear in 1990 when all these governors came over, when they took over Obasanjo's government. And many of the northerners said to change the law of the north to Sharia law. Now, the people that voted them, voted them because they were supposed to bring the Sharia law. But what caused the problem is, many of these governors were drinking, womanizing, and the masses were like, you are not abiding by Sharia law. <laughs> you must, you too must abide by Sharia law. So they were now going after the rulers. Now, in Lagos, we do not know the extent of poverty in the north. Poverty in the north. We just say, since the northerners have been in power all this time, the north is better than Lagos. And even if they are not better than the South, it is their fault. So we generalize, which is wrong, because they are our brothers and sisters. So the way we even look at it as a nation is wrong. And this is the way the leaders in power want us to look at it, so there is division and there will always be division. The people in North are poor. You see poverty that will, you cannot imagine in the North as a young, in the 70s and 80s, that Nigerians will become suicide bombers. I mean, probably plant bombs. Yes, maybe we could get to that state. But become suicide bombers. You see, me too, I'm in shock that a Nigerian will put a bomb on himself and blast all of us in this room. I mean, we know it is the Iraqis and the Pakistans and all those that do that. Not Nigerians, we love life too much. Yes. We want to party. Same we want to yeah. look. We we don't want to die. Like we don't want to die. So when we have degenerated to that extent, it calls for everybody to just say, "Hey, we are in trouble." What is happening in this country? When you see what happened in the Delta area, if you see the arms these boys brought out when amnesty, when the government gave them amnesty, it was a war going on in the Delta states. When you see the guns and the the bombs and the rockets these people had. And then they made a statement. They said, this is only half of what they have. But they are not going to relinquish the rest because they don't trust the government. Where did they get these arms from? Who is supplying them these arms? Can Nigeria afford to go like Congo or Sudan or Somalia? So we are in a very frightful state. Then somebody like me, I need to find the, I need to be optimistic. If I fail to be optimistic, then, then I'm not being part of the solution. I'm being part of the problem. If I don't give the youths hope, then that means I'm urging them on to be violent and cause catastrophe. 
On that note, I want to thank you for a wonderful interview. Yeah, well, we do expect a wonderful show tonight. Um, definitely. You definitely Even this cold, out. see my hands are freezing. <laughs> I'm still trying. As I call out of the for you, yeah. Um, I want to thank Femi Kuti for um, joining us today on our Freak Lounge Live, which will be um, aired on tradiov.com, My True Spot, and also on This Is Africa. I am your host, Survivor Falarin.